Behind you is Market Square. You know, this green open space was used by farmers to sell their wares. They would bring fresh produce in at least six days a week, certainly not on the Sabbath, and uh, people would come and, and shop. But it's also the place where the local militia might turn out to run through their drills, like I pointed out they did on Lexington Green, which was the church lawn of Jonas Clark. And, uh, you know, early America, by the way, all adult male men were part of the militia. They need, just like Israel, ancient Israel, all adult males, they were 20 years old and up. In colonial America, each state may have been different. Here in Virginia, it, it was like 16, 16 to 60. You were part of the militia, and so you carried with you the most advanced weapon of the day. You had the right and responsibility, you know, right and responsibility to keep and bear arms and to know how to use them because if the nation needed you, you had to be ready to be called out. You know, as somebody once said, you know, in recent years as we've debated the Second Amendment, some, some have said, well, yeah, I think everybody should be able to have a gun so they can hunt. But as one, one friend of mine said, he said, look, the Second Amendment you know, is, does not grant us a right to have guns so we can shoot rabbits, but so that we can shoot tyrants. <laughs> That's why we have the Second Amendment right. It's not for hunting. It's for the very reason that the early, you know, the colonial individuals, the militia and others would turn out and, and prepare themselves if they ever had to go to war, and they certainly did at the time of the American Revolution. Um, now, back behind us, is the powder magazine, this octagonal shaped building. This was built in 1715, same year as Bruton Parish Church. It was built to store the arms, ammunition, powder, flints, <clears throat> tents, swords, canteens, everything that would be needed for the militia who comprised the army to protect themselves in any event that was necessary. After the Civil War, the building was used as a market, a Baptist meeting house, a dancing school, a livery stable, all kinds of different things. And of course, now it's been presented to look like it would have back in colonial times. Now, there's an event that took place at the Powder Magazine that was a spark that ignited the revolution in Virginia. In March of 1775, the House of Burgesses had been forced out of Williamsburg and they were meeting in Richmond at St. John's Church. It was there that Patrick Henry gave his famous speech, Give Me Liberty or Give Me Death, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Now the context of the resolution that they were debating that precipitated Henry's speech was that it had been suggested we, as the House of Burgesses, or the legislature, we authorize the various and suggest that the various counties call out their militia and begin to train them. Now, some of the members of the House of Burgesses, well, they all knew that the, that the governor and England would look at this as an act of preparation for war. So many were very hesitant, well, we, we can't do this. You know, they might send troops, so you know, no telling what's going to happen. And, and as they were debating, that's when Patrick Henry stood up and said, I know not what course others may take, you know, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. And he spoke of how, you know, he was prepared to give whatever price it was. Forbid it, Almighty God, were his words. So after that, after his speech, after the, they agreed because of Patrick Henry, they voted yes. We authorized this, and so the various states began to get their militias together. <clears throat> well, when Governor Dunmore learned of their resolve to use forces necessary, he secretly sent some men at night. Now, he was living up in the palace that we just saw, the governor's palace. So on the night preceding the 21st of April, he sent some of his men secretly up to the magazine. They went into the magazine, and, the, and they confiscated all the guns of the colonists that were stored there. Well, when Patrick Henry got word of this, he said, this is intolerable. This, these arms belong to the people. So what he did, he lived in Hanover County, up around Richmond. And so he gathered together the militia, 
was going to march to Williamsburg and demand that Governor Dunmore return that powder that he had stole and guns that he'd stole to return it or pay for it. Now, before setting out, Henry not only spoke to the militia leaders there in Hanover County, but also to the county committee, the governing body of, of Hanover, as well as all, a lot of other people who had gathered together. This was a serious time. And of course, you know, so many of the men turned out. Now, a historian, uh, one of Henry's biographers, William Wirt, relates what happens when Patrick Henry stood up to give a speech to the militia and all of the people gathered to show them, you know, to encourage them in the cause of liberty. This is why we need to march as a militia down to Williamsburg and the demand that the governor uh, 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 return that which he's stolen from us. And I don't have time to, to relate all of the words of that speech. So he relates all these things. He begins to speak to them of the cause of liberty and, and, and the blood of their countrymen already crying out from up in New England from fighting that it had gone on. And he went on to say this. He said, he had no doubt. This is how William Wirt, Wirt, Wirt is relating what Patrick Henry said that night to the militia. He had no doubt, he said, that that God who in former ages had hardened Pharaoh's heart that he might show forth his power and glory in the redemption of his chosen people, had for similar purposes permitted the flagrant outrages which had occurred in Williamsburg and throughout the continent. It was for them now to determine whether they were worthy of this divine interference, whether they would accept the high boon now held out to them by heaven, that if they would, though it might lead them through a sea of blood, they were to remember that the same God whose power divided the Red Sea for the deliverance of Israel still reigned in all his glory, unchanged and unchangeable, was still the enemy of the oppressor and the friend of the oppressed, that he would cover them from their enemies by a pillar of fire, that for his own part he was anxious that his native country should distinguish itself in this grand career of liberty and glory and snatch the noble prize which was now offered to their grasp. The effect was equal to his wishes. The meeting was in a flame and the decision immediately taken that the powder should be retrieved or counterbalanced by a reprisal. <clears throat> so it's interesting that... that uh, Patrick Henry was presenting an idea that had been presented many times before. John Adams writes to Abigail when he was in Philadelphia and heard Reverend George, George Duffield preach a sermon. And in this sermon, he, he recounted the fact, the only way to explain the irrational behavior of King George III is that God hardened his heart just like he hardened Pharaoh's. There's no other way. It was crazy what the king was doing. The way he's treating his colleagues, the only ways. I mean, you know, we all have thought Pharaoh must have been an idiot <laughs> ten times. Isn't that right? Yeah. And the same thing, King George III. Even members of his own parliament stood up and said, what are you doing? You know, this is not sane. Patrick Henry was expressing the idea that many ministers had preached. The only way to describe these events... And remember, we need to have a providential view of history, not only in the past, but right now. But to have a providential view of the incidences that have been occurring in our life. Incidences going on with, with conflicts with the Muslim terrorists. Incidences going on with the battle of worldviews in America and the th things that we're facing now. You know, we've got to be able to see, God, what are you doing? What view do you have? What is a providential view? But if we've never been taught a providential perspective of history in the past, which we haven't if you only got your history from state schools, then how can we discern and judge? It's very difficult. But our founders were taught this. Why? Because this is what the ministers taught. They preached this. They preached current events in the light of God's providence like Duffield did. And, and, and affected Adams, and who later spoke of this. And, if, and Patrick Henry, I don't know, you know, he probably heard it from preachers somewhere, but he already had a providential view, so it would not be hard for him to discern. Just like God hardened Pharaoh's heart, he's doing the same thing in order to show his power and glory and advance his kingdom purposes at this time in history. The American Revolution is a the best example in all of history of Christian resistance to tyranny. The Bible teaches we must obey God rather than men. And when men begin to act the tyrant, the Bible also reveals to us there are steps that we must take to resist tyranny. 
First, to protest and take legal action. Second, to flee, if that's an option. The very last step is to use force in self-defense. The founders knew this. They acted upon this principle in the American Revolution. Fighting had taken place for 14 months. Then the king kicked him out, declared him in a state of nature. And then it was even a half a year later before they said, we have no choice but to form our own nation, which they did. It's a marvelous example. And Henry knew it, and so he recognized God is that. So guess what? The militia marched down here. By the time they got here, Lord Dunmore heard they were coming, so he split the scene. He got out of town. He never came back here to the capital.